Hopefully you can hear me now. <laughs> can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Ah, there we go. Okay. Yeah, I had turned off my microphone because I was like, <clears throat> and I figured you guys didn't want to hear it. I have been, hi, Mara Dim. I have been uh, practicing Dunton, and I'm frankly sick of him. He took up my whole weekend. <laughs> and I'm like, Dunton, I'm done with you. Just kidding. I'm, I'm just, he, he's, ugh. I had nightmares about him all weekend because I've been working on all the stuff I'm doing for uh, AQSG seminar. I'm in a good place. Um, done a bunch of run-throughs. I'm still about 15 minutes over. Um, the challenge of in my mind I'm going I have a two hour presentation and I put together a two hour presentation but the problem is I have to leave like 10-15 minutes for questions <laughs> so I gotta dial that back that's always hard to do but I think it's better time wise in terms of like time from edit to actually having to present um, even though it's hard to take stuff out it's easier to take stuff out than to try to find stuff to put back in. So, yes, editing is the worst. And especially editing yourself. Like, I could take anybody else's stuff. I mean, that was, like, that's kind of my profession is taking other people's content and going, like, here's what we can take out. Here's what we can reformat. Here's, you know, all that stuff. But to do it with your own stuff is so hard. Um, but anyway, in a good place. I'm getting very excited for AQSG seminar. Um but yeah, I need, a, I need a break from Dunton. So I am very happy to see you guys. Um, <clears throat> I do have a really funny Dunton thing that I want to read you. But I'm going to save it till Thursday. Just because, <laughs> like I said, he's just like, Ugh, get out of my head, Dunton. Um, so excited to be on some Florence Petto today. Um, I hope you guys had a great weekend. Um, let's see who's here. I know he said hi to Angelina and Druid. And Eva and Morrow Dim. Ivy, hi. So before I forget, today is a very important day. Somebody in our circle here, this is their birthday week. That would be me. <laughs> but more importantly, somebody in our circle's birthday is today. Druid, it's for it's your it's your birthday today. I did not know this until this morning. <laughs> um, she tried to tell me yesterday and I was like, had totally turned off all of my, my stuff. So please, please give Druid a big uh, digital happy birthday squeeze. Um, I will not sing to you. And that is my birthday present to you <laughs> because you do not want to have your eardrums to bleed on your birthday. Um, I'm a terrible, terrible singer. So you guys all from your desks or your laptops or your phones, you sing happy birthday to Druid. Um, Druid is, uh, of a timeless age. <laughs> so <laughs> I think, you know, we're both going to claim that we're 29 plus this week. <laughs> so, <laughs> so all good. Um, did somebody else? Oh, Maro Dim, it's your Friday. So I'm guessing that you worked the weekend and now today you get days off tomorrow. I hope that's the case. That's good. I love it when it's like the Friday. Hi, Kellen. Yay. <laughs> oh, birthdays are great. You know, you get to be an adult and it's like the joy of being a child, you know, that like cake and ice cream and presents and all that stuff. It doesn't necessarily hold the same. <laughs> I mean, you're kind of a jerk if you expect that stuff. <laughs> but it's always so fun when people do it for you. Um, that's kind of one of the things, like maybe one of the only things I miss about working like in a corporate setting is the fact that <clears throat> a lot of workplaces like to do birthdays because, um, you know, it's like a, it's like a nice safe thing to, <laughs> to celebrate. And I do miss that. I do miss getting, you know, the cake and the all of the accolades and all that stuff. But I can do it for myself and we can do it for each other. So it is a beautiful day. And I have to say, I have my windows open. I have all of my air conditioners are on fan only. It is, the weather has been absolutely gorgeous here in the mid-Atlantic. Um, crossing my fingers, it stays like this for a little while. I think that this week is supposed to be good. So, um, yeah, like September's one of those months where you could have a hurricane and it'll be like 102 the next day, 
or you know it's nice crisp fall weather you know apple picking so um you never know what you're going to get in september and i hope it stays cool because this oh i love fall so much you know it's nice and cool and you know you open the windows and at night you kind of get the breeze of like <clears throat> wood fires um a lot of the people around me have patios and they they have the chimeneas and it oh it just smells like fall i love it i love it um i can tell you i'm not a pumpkin spice person though <laughs> I don't hate it. I just don't love it. Um, and when I saw pumpkin spice spam, I said, we are done here. <laughs> like, that is ridiculous. Um, <clears throat> although my son says supposedly it's good. This pumpkin spice spam is like, um, you know, if you think like pork chops and applesauce, kind of savory meat and like sweet fruity, that's supposedly what uh, pumpkin spice spam is like. <clears throat> so... I got something, oh, now pie, pumpkin pie, I live for pumpkin pie. I could eat that all year round. Um, and sweet potato pie is like a good second. You know, it's not, sweet potato pie is not quite like pumpkin, but it's, I feel like it's a good like substitution and you can usually get that all year round. So yeah, I can eat whole pies as well. Whole cakes, whole pies. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I wanted to show you guys something cool. So you may have heard of Canva. It's C-A-N-V-A. It's like an online um, editing program platform kind of thing. Um, and the basic version of it's free, which is what I have. <laughs> um, and then, of course, they have a pro uh, version where you can get lots of cool stuff, um, like lots of graphics and, and stuff like that. So, But I just use the free version, and I have a lot of my own graphics from my job. So <clears throat> I can usually upload stuff that uh, would ordinarily cost on Canva. But what I didn't know until recently, and, and this is probably a recent thing with them, um, I don't know, comparatively speaking, you can like create a business card or a postcard or like a, you know, some kind of thing. And um, you can have your stuff printed. So I made a business card for um, a QSG seminar because it occurred to me, um, people, what's a nice way of saying this? <laughs> The, the members of AQSG are, are maybe a little bit more on the mature side. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, the simple, like, hey, go follow me on Instagram, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> they kind of like a business card. So anyway, I made these. And then on the back, because still shilling my Dutton stuff, I got a, a QR code and the bit.ly link. So... I love old school too. I love business cards. Um, I actually have a huge business card collection of people just, you know, that I've collected over the years that I think are like good design and stuff. So I thought I'd share that with you guys. And if you need business cards, you know, it's like 20 some dollars for 50 of them. Um, that's probably not the cheapest in the world, but the fact that you can get 50 for 20 bucks and they came in like five days, maybe, um, it's a pretty good deal. So the other random thing, <laughs> this is non-quilt related. Have you guys ever seen this catalog? It's the King Arthur Baking Company. Three or four years ago, I ordered something from these people. And you know, you see King Arthur flour <clears throat> and uh, baking mixes and stuff sometimes in your finer grocery stores. Um, but I didn't realize they have this whole company of stuff and you know like all i mean all kinds of baking stuff i never can imagine i'm not a great cook i mean i i can cook it's okay i mean i can bake stuff i understand i don't love it um i prefer eating the product of cooking <laughs> more than i like making it um but from ordering one item i keep getting this catalog and i think it comes monthly and I, you guys this is food porn i mean look at this look at this <laughs> They, I, they have, they'll print recipes in here and I have not ordered a single thing from them since that first order. Um, it was actually material, like the, the, uh, ingredients to make fruit cake and they have like this, um, really finely minced, um, fruit, like uh, dried fruit that is very, was very good. These fruit cakes were delicious. Um, but yeah, so I highly recommend, I'm pretty sure you can just go in there and like get yourself on some kind of mailing list. I mean, look at that, look at that scone. You can see the person's, I mean, that's not my hand. <laughs> yes, it's the, <laughs> the seed catalog, yes. <laughs> um, 
but yeah, there are some of these things I just didn't even know it, it, like existed. And then, um, you know, they get into the savory stuff. It makes me so hungry every time we get this guy. <laughs> I mean, look at that pizza. Oh man. Um, everything in here is like super expensive though. So <clears throat> I get my baking pans at like Walmart. Um, but yeah, they have like all the professional stuff. Anyway, I highly recommend if you are a motivated and hobby baker, this is, this is good stuff. Yeah, so I'll stop now. Hi, Les Weka. <laughs> I'll stop now because I too am getting hungry. Um, I had a, a quick and, and um, unsatisfying lunch. <laughs> so that's the big stuff. Like I said, my weekend was all done all the time. And I need a break from him. So are you ready for some pedo? Um, good old Florence. Uh, yeah, I've been reading a lot of her too, her, her letters. <clears throat> but honestly, she's so entertaining. She's so, you guys know, we've, we've talked about her. She's, she's a terrible gossip <laughs> in the best way possible because without her, there's a lot of stuff we, we would not know. Um, <clears throat> so her books, as I said the other day, are um, Historic Quilts was the first one. Oh, thank you, Las Weka. Um, if you just joined us, you might not have heard, it is also Druid's birthday week, and today is her birthday. So, um, <clears throat> wonderful people are born in September. I don't know if you guys knew that. Some of the best people, in fact. Um, <laughs> so, just so you're aware. Um, <clears throat> and then Florence's other book is American Quilts and Coverlets. And I have not even cracked this one. Um, I, you know, I flipped through it, but we'll see about reading that one. Because I don't know how different it is from this book. So... Oh, your dad turns 91 tomorrow. Oh my gosh, Ivy. Good for him. Yeah, I feel like people, <laughs> I don't know if you guys are a, a fan of Patton Oswalt, the comedian. He has this bit though he does. It's one of his stand-up pieces. And he says, you know, I have a lot of respect for, you know, mature people, older people. And he's like, I really think that you reach a certain age that you can kind of get away with anything, right? Um, <clears throat> and he feels like, he felt like, you know, if you're 100, you should be able to kill people. Like nobody should be able to arrest you for killing somebody. And then start backing that up. Like, you know, maybe at 95, you can commit um, like armed robbery. Like that'll be okay. Um, and then maybe at 90, like simple assault and you don't get in trouble. Um, in your 80s, you can start with littering. <laughs> <It's> so ridiculous. <laughs> but yes, I think, um, I think to myself, if I make it that long, um, I will greatly enjoy my 90s because I will just be the biggest jerk. <laughs> I'm going to let it fly. Everything I ever wanted to say is going to come out in my 90s. So that's what, that's what we can all look forward to, right? Okay, so I read the introduction to historic quilts the other day. <clears throat> so let's get started with chapter one. It's called A Notable Group, chapter one, part one. The earliest made patchwork quilts in my collection show ornamentation planned and executed with regard to the design as a whole quilt, a whole unit, sorry. This is true whether the technique employed was that of appliqued or pieced work. Favorite compositions are those fashioned about a central medallion, floral or ge geometric, a wide or a narrow border often enclosed an intermediate area decorated with sprays of flowers, stars, or other motifs. Applied to background material comp comprised of two or three widths of homespun cotton or linen seamed together. Quilts of this type and period usually were very large. <laughs> Pedo time. <laughs> oh my gosh, Angelina, I love that. Um, oh, I was going to mention, I know you said you're uh, working with fabric, so you didn't want to have popcorn. <clears throat> They make these things, they're gamer chopsticks. It's like this little ring that you wear on your fingers, and it's a chopstick. And so you just squeeze your fingers together, and the chopsticks pinch. So you can use them to eat Cheetos and not get it on your quilt. <laughs> <clears throat> I think the original makers of these were on Etsy. Um, yeah, they're brilliant. And they ha there's knockoff ones on Amazon now, but um, if you can find the original guy, um, they're, he, I think he 3D printed them. They're absolute genius. So, a quilt happily illustrative of this early method is one made by Barbara Frick. 
Flowers, leaves, and stems in tones of rose, pink, lavender, brown, and peculiar shades of blue-green cut from handsome English chintz hold central position, while smaller sprays spring at regular intervals from a serpentine stem border. An inner sawtooth patch arrangement frames the central floral group, which in turn is encircled with a bow knot and swag border of the same turquoise blue calico. Turquoise. <clears throat> Patterned with, with a small white dot. I mean, how many old quilts do you look at and not realize how, like what they like the color originally was um you know because light does an, a real like you know a real damage to quilts and I mean fabric of any kind light and heat um <clears throat> will cause cotton to degrade uh but you can often kind of peek into the seam of an old quilt and see the real like the original colors and oh my word some of these quilts had like these amazing colors um, and even the ones that got washed and washed and washed and washed, sometimes you can peel up the edge and see, you know, like right between those stitches and see what it used to look like. And like turquoise. I mean, I don't even know how you get turquoise dye wise, um, you know, back before synthetic dyes or, you know, the more modern dyes. The outer border is formed of a large sawtooth patch showing a deeper shade of blue. The piece is finished with handmade fringe. Not only nice arrangement and proportion, but harmonious coloring and superb workmanship place this quilt in the artistic category. It is very large and well-preserved, though the background material has acquired a coffee and cream mellowness. Family history makes it possible to date Barbara's spread with reasonable accuracy. Um, <clears throat> and you know what? I forgot to plug in my, my little document camera, but here is what the quilt looks like. So, I mean, in black and white, I don't know. It's not much to look at. I mean, it's pretty. It's, it's a very pretty composition. But to imagine that that quilt has all these colors in it, you know? Um, I'd love to see it, you know, in person. <clears throat> My guess is it's probably in a museum or something. Um, a Huguenot refugee from the Palatinate. Oh my gosh, you guys, this is something that's been coming up and I still need to look it up. And I'm sure I'm positive it has to do with like all of the Central European, like um, the Habsburgs and all of those people. But uh, like Austria, Germany, um, I guess to some degree, like the Czech Republic, Poland, like that whole area I know was kind of under <clears throat> like a sort of single rule at one time. Um but I keep seeing these references to the Palatinate, P-A-L-A-T-I-N-A-T-E. And by reference, I know that this has got to be like some of these areas in Europe. Um, but I haven't looked it up. Uh, and that's a piece of history that I'm really interested in, you know, like exactly what is that? Um, I mentioned the other day, there's a book I'm reading called Hex Marks the Spot about the Pennsylvania Dutch. And she talks th about the Palatinate all the time. Um, so, you know, my guess this is like where some of like the Pennsylvania folks, I mean, or the, the German settlers that a lot of them came to Pennsylvania, but <clears throat> I'm guessing that's this area of like, again, German people, um, Moravian, um, let's see, Moravia and Bavaria are two different like areas, like right outside of Germany. Um, I think Moravia is more of like, um, sort of Czech Republic area, whereas Bavaria is more over on the German side. Um, and probably people that actually live in Europe know more about this than me, obviously. I'm, I'm kind of kind of throwing this out there. Like, I don't know the details uh, specifically. But again, interesting stuff because, you know, you've got these European influences, even though quilts are, you know, so very American. Um, you know, we know about these influences. <coughs> So a Huguenot refugee from the Palatinate, John Conrad Frick, sailed with his wife, Barbara Enton, from Rotterdam on the ship Pennsylvania. Oh, you're going to Pennsylvania on a ship named Pennsylvania. September 11th, 1732, and became one of the original settlers and founders of Germantown, Pennsylvania. Oh my gosh. Germantown, Pennsylvania is where Dr. Dunton, oh gosh, Dunton's everywhere. <laughs> the Germantown hospitals where he did his residency. Isn't that wild? 
Um, their son, Peter Frick, born in Germantown, uh, November 9th, 1743, moved to Baltimore Town. That is what Baltimore was once upon, when it's upon a time called Baltimore Town, during the heat of the revolution and soon took an active part in its affairs. In 1797, he was elected to represent the fourth ward of the city at its incorporation. He had married Barbara, daughter of Dr. John Christopher Bridenhart, Bradenhart. It is not known whether Barbara, the wife of John Frick, or Barbara Frick, the wife of Dr. Bradenhart, made the quilt. Don't you love it when everybody names everybody the same? <laughs> you should see, not to digress too much, but um, I actually am going to mention this in my um, in my presentation, but <clears throat> when I was looking, I was trying to find a little bit of information about Dr. Dutton's wife or uh, his mother, because her, his father's lineage is documented. Um, what the frick? <laughs> his father's uh, lineage is documented in this colonial families thing. So like I kind of knew all the way up the line, like who he's related to over on the Dutton side. But his mother's side are the, the Gemmels, G-E-M-M-I-L-L. So I start looking at her, and I'm like, okay, who, oh, so there's this Anna Maria uh, Gordon Gemmel Dunton, and then there's Anna Maria Gemmel Dunton. They are two different people. <laughs> I, I, like, I still can't wrap my head around this, and I keep look, I kept looking at it thinking, there's got to be a mistake. This cannot possibly be right. But apparently, Dr. Dunton's aunt, his father's sister, was named Anna Maria Gemmel Dunton. It's like, this is what she was born as. And then he marries a woman named Anna Maria Gordon Gemmel. That's what she's born as. <sighs> yes. Okay, Mara Dim right. Yes. A father, brother, husband, son. Yes. And you never know. And the only thing you can do is you look at their dates. But if like, say, like in your case, brother and husband, they might be close in age. And so if you only have, like, Robert whatever, Smith, like, God help you if you're going to figure out which Robert Smith did what. It's insane. Um, like, come on, you guys. Please come up with some original names. <laughs> I like the names like Trifenia and Milka and Axa because you know those names, they didn't, like, everybody in the family wasn't named those names. <clears throat> um. Okay, so the son of Peter and Barbara Frick was the great-grandfather of Mrs. Henry Barton Jacobs, who, at her death in 1937, left a fine art collection to the city of Baltimore. Oh, I'm going to have to look this up. The quilt is owned and shown by courtesy of Mrs. Barbara Frick Davidson of Easton, Maryland, great-great-granddaughter of Barbara Frick Bradenhart. Now, Easton, Maryland is out on the eastern shore. Um, <clears throat> I might have mentioned this before. Maryland is a really small state, but we are divided into like three very distinct areas. So there's the Eastern Shore, which is like the beach. And then there's Central Maryland, which is Baltimore. Like, <laughs> there's a lot more there, but like Baltimore. And then Western Maryland is like literally over the mountains and really might as well be like West Virginia because it's, it's like just very different out there. Um, so... Florence Petto, I know, spent a lot of time on the Eastern Shore lecturing, and there is a crap ton of awesome old quilts out there that are always going up for auction. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, it's just a heinous drive for me, or I would be out there like every week, like, give me quilts, give me quilts. <laughs> it's probably good I don't live close enough to get out there that often. <clears throat> and Celestial is a beautiful name. Equally notable for beauty and refined workmanship is the pheasants. Birds in iridescent colors and flowers, softly pastel, cut from highly glazed chintz, have been disposed centrally and along the edge of the spread. The background material is deep cream with age. As in the Barbara Frick quilt, tiny quilting stitches have been so minutely spaced that they produce a crepe-like texture suggestive of stippling. Oh man, so that means they're like tiny little stitches. A quality difficult to capture in a photograph. Such bed covers, thinly interlined, were intended for use as counterpanes. Beauty, not warmth, was the motivating idea. So <clears throat> for the longest time, I couldn't figure out, like, what is a counterpane? 
Um, but essentially, counterpanes and coverlets are kind of like, I think they kind of names use it interchangeably. <clears throat> and they're what you put over the bed for company. Like, you know, look at my beautiful bed. And then you take that off. You don't sleep under it. You don't let anybody put their feet on it. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's only for, for show. It's not for touching or laying under. Uh, dimensions are 90 inches by 96 inches. A knotted fringe finishes the edges. They, they fringe these things a lot. They put fringe on them a lot. And I know sometimes they hand knotted the fringe. Um, and I, I would assume that these quilts she's talking about are hand. Like they're literally stowing a little tap, you know, a little thing on there and then doing the knotting. Um, as you do with fringe. <laughs> The pheasants was given to Mrs. Joseph V. Wright in 1905 by her cousin, General Richard Thomas, who had no direct descendants. All those who might have known something about the quilt maker have passed on. General Thomas was born in 1815 in Piney Neck, Queen Anne's County, Maryland. So much going on in Maryland. And he said the quilt had been made by his aunt, name not recorded, at some time prior to 1800. At Kenmore, home of Betty Lewis, George Washington's sister in Fredericksburg, Virginia, where there is displayed a piece of quilt with almost identical design, which is claimed, which it is claimed was made just before the revolution. Um, I know I've seen this. Um, I grew up in Fredericksburg, Virginia, and my mom still lives there, or right outside of Fredericksburg. She actually did a quilt documentation project back in the 80s with Kenmore, and um, <clears throat> I want to go back there soon because it's been a really long time, um, probably since my childhood that I've been there. But like, oh, I was such a nerd. I loved to. I liked to go there because it's a very pretty house, and it's like right there in the middle of town. And um, I had like my ninth or tenth birthday party there. <laughs> I'm the dork that would take like all my friends to, to Williamsburg for like <laughs> a party. Um, but yeah, we went to, we went to, um, Kenmore, we had some tea and, uh, some gingerbread, I think. And, um, but yeah, it's funny when I see things written about it and I'm like, I have to sit back and think like, oh, this is literally a piece of history. Like when I was a kid, I was just like, oh, this old crap. <laughs> I like the gardens and I like the cool, like pictures and things. And the, they have a great gift shop there. <laughs> I never like really got it until, you know, an adult, as an adult. Oh, your grandmother was the only other person who used the word counterpane. You know, honestly, Drew, I would never heard the term and still, until I started reading these books. I just had always heard bedspread. You know, that, that was pretty much the only word I remember was bedspread. <clears throat> um, <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Where'd I go? I skipped ahead. Um, so the pheasants is now owned and shown by courtesy of Mrs. Philemon K. Wright of Easton, Maryland. So this is the pheasants. And you can already see her pictures are really a lot better <laughs> than Ruth Finley and Marie Webster's. Although Marie Webster did have those color photos, but that was, that was the second edition. So. Okay, the next one is a floral medallion. Another example of early rare needlework employing lustrous flowered chintz to produce the central bouquet group framed in this piece by a large garland. The whole effect is one of voluptuous abundance and eye-delighting harmony. <laughs> ah, I love it. Uh, colors range through purple, lilac, delphinium, blue, uh, rust, apricot gold yellow cherry red shades of rose to tan mauve and gray green it's so interesting to me that she finds all of that in this these chintz patterns i just have never liked chintz and so i've never really looked at them that closely but these descriptions um and seeing some actual old pieces of chintz in dr dutton's collection and our friend jill she has this beautiful old chintz quilt um, and really looking at that up, up close, then, um, you know, you really do see a lot more. They're, they, they get faded, you know, and they sort of, to me, you know, from a distance, they're kind of dusty rose and tan. Like, that's when I think of chintz. But there really is a lot in there. And, like, the, the, the hand block, you know, they did the hand block prints to make those. 
<clears throat> Full-blown blossoms in great variety have been cut close to their printed outlines, the deeply serrated leaves and pointed petals presenting a nice problem for neat applique work, a problem which would have overwhelmed anyone less than a mistress of the art of sewing. Hi, Robin. We're reading chapter one of Florence Petto's book. The background material is a fine cambric, which I think, if I remember correctly, cambric is linen. Um, and the manner in which the piece has been quilted is unique and challenges inspection. Lines in groups of three, in an exactitude of spacing less than one quarter of an inch apart. So this is like the original matchstick quilting. Um, run diagonally in one direction across the entire quilt. Um, that's unique. I don't know that I've ever seen something like that. I mean, you know, outside of a modern quilt. The spread has been carefully repaired and reinforced in many places and still looks deliciously fresh and gay and aristocratic. Nothing is known of the maker. The piece was one in a collection formed by Colonel George H. Ketchum of Toledo, Ohio, which was exhibited in the Toledo Museum of Art for a time pre preceding their removal for sale at the American Art Association Anderson Galleries in New York City on May 5th, 1926. So we know when this was sold, I guess. The collection included patchwork quilts of distinguished of distinguished beauty, but it was not recorded from what sources the late Colonel had made his selections. Men have shown keen appreciation and discriminating taste in choosing examples of this branch of feminine handiwork for their collections. Floral Medallion is now owned and shown by courtesy of Mrs. John Bush of New York City. And this is the Floral Medallion. And this actually is very pretty. I mean, even, even though it's only black and white, I, we can kind of imagine what it looks like. So we've got that really dense um, in the middle and then like that beautiful frame around it and then the corner pieces. You could do some really amazing things, um, you know, cutting up the chintz and then putting it back on. Um, they, they made, I mean, you know, essentially it's like, if you think about decoupage, I mean, that's essentially what they were doing with these cut quilts and coverlets. They would take these, you know, these pieces of um, hand blocked chintz prints and you know cut them up and then kind of like collage make them into you know this like really beautiful assemblage um and you know i i think my my guess is and i don't know if i've actually seen this written anywhere or if i'm just making this up but i would think that you know the chintz uh because it was imported you know it was coming from india and in some cases um europe the the chintz would be like kind of expensive you know they could they could uh homespin you know that that homespun stuff for the backing you know but the chintz you know they may only be able to afford even wealthy people may only be able to afford like a certain you know quantity of it and so i think it makes sense to like cut it up and like you know extend it yeah you know to cut out those motifs and extend it so just lost my page okay <clears throat> equally favored with the method of making a quilt involving a complete design applique to a full-size background was one of building a pattern out of a series of borders from a central block many 18th and early 19th century pieces show this technique it was used by ooh, <laughs> here's a name we won't forget Zabaya Smallwood Hewson Zabaya is spelled Z-I-B-I-A-H. I always feel like those, those Aya names, like Jeremiah, Jebediah, Zabaya, they're like, they're like big biblical names, I think. Um, so Zabaya, there's a new one for you. So it was used by Zab Zabaya in the quilt she made. Family tradition says, from fabrics manufactured in her husband's famous factory, Ruth Finley, I think, wrote about this. I'm pretty sure Hewson, Hewson was the factory that we read about way back when we read Ruth Finley's book. I'm pretty sure I remember that. So his factory was one of the first weaving, dyeing, and printing establishments in America. No sample books seem to have been kept by the early textile firms. And if the assumption that Zabaya used Hewson prints, and it sounds logical, 
is correct, her quilt becomes important as a sample index of American-made goods. Um, so now her quilt, but also somebody else's quilt, and I'm drawing a complete blank on it because I can never remember names, but um, the woman, or it might have even been a, young, a younger woman, a girl whose father likely traded or did something with Hewson, um, would have gotten those those prints for his his daughters and his wife to make dresses out of and then they used it to make um some a quilt or some quilts and so there remains another version of it and so long story short <laughs> what you know th for something that doesn't you know a, a, a fabric factory that does not have um you know the historic records of the fabric that they made but we have at least two quilts that are are, are presumed to have been made out of that fabric they are documents and the importance of things like that you know i mean that's a, this is like a perfect example um you know and on one hand you could think like oh it's nice to know what pretty things they made but on the other hand we're talking about major important industrial revolution uh people factories all this stuff in the mills you know, and there's there's a really important story associated with the mills. Um, many stories, really. The the women that worked there, the the you know, you got all the labor conditions, all that stuff. Um, you know, it's a really important piece of history. And so, with these two quilts, we're talking about documentation that doesn't exist anywhere else. Make a coat out of that quilt coat, people. <laughs> I have to tell you guys, Jill has has pinged me a couple times about she sold some quilts and she's like I think this is going to a quilt coat person they're having this made into a coat and I'm like oh I'm like, you know you need to make a living you can't say I'm not going to sell you this quilt although I do know some collectors and dealers that have said that you're going to make a coat out of this uh no ma'am I'm not going to sell it to you I know I know somebody that, that did that um and I say good for her I wouldn't have because I would need the money, but I would cry and say goodbye to that quilt. But I do know a collector that was like, I'm not going to have you cut this quilt up. So power to the people. <laughs> um, let's see, where did I leave off here? Um, yeah, I lost my place here. Okay. John Hewson and Son had come to the colonies under the patronage of Benjamin Franklin. The firm, established in Philadelphia and operating from 1774 to 1810, became famous and enjoyed the custom of George Washington and his wife Martha. During the Revolution, Hewson served in the army on the Patriot side, and the British put a price on his head. Oh. The mother country had not taken kindly to the defection of her skilled craftsmen. That's right. Houston basically was like, I'm going to, I'm going to sneak some of these, uh, uh, um, we, uh, what do they call them? The, the machines, the, the looms. I'm going to sneak some looms out of England and bring them here. I'm remembering this now. And they were not happy. So they, they were unhappy with craftsmen who came over the water to ply their trades in competition with home industries. But of course, the Americans were like, heck yeah, we want our own thing going on. We don't want to have to, you know, be like, uh, you know, burdened by the king and, you know, all of his nonsense. Some historic accounts say that Houston was captured by the enemy and rescued by a small band of patriots on the eve of his execution. Wow. I bet that's an interesting his historic story. Mrs. Houston's quilt has interest, not only because of its possibly historic fabrics, but because of its composition, the series of six borders, some pieced and some appliqued, and all varying in width, which surround a central block about one yard square. This center square with white ground has been printed in what would have been a typical Houston floral pattern, an entire bedspread, extremely beautiful, so printed and purporting to be Houston work, is the property of the Pennsylvania Museum of Art. The printing shows sharply defined outlines and etched appearance. There are characteristic vases holding graceful flower sprays, birds perched on twigs, and hovering butterflies. Prevailing colors in the printed spread and in the center square of the patch quilt are rich mulberry, plum, gold, yellow, turquoise blue, and a few indefinite greens. 
oh, Lonesome Dove. You know, I've, I've heard, I, I mean, I know of the novel. I've never read it. He wore quilted pants. What? Okay, now I'm going to have to read Lonesome Dove. <laughs> I did not know that there was any sewing <laughs> in Lonesome Dove. Um, so this, I don't, uh, I don't think she has a picture of this quilt. I thought, I thought the Houston quilt was going to be in here. It's not. Well, bummer. <clears throat> the simple patch patterns used in the surrounding borders seem a bit naive in comparison with the refined elegance obtaining in the central motif. Successively, there are a sawtooth patch border, a zigzag arrangement, a serpentine vine with buds, a chained square with corners of perched birds, a slave chain, and a final wide border of brown glazed chintz with latticework design and opulent pink roses. <laughs> Constantly patching his britches. <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> Yeah, I thought maybe this quilt, yeah, it's definitely not that one. Well, that's a shame. I would, I would really like to see this quilt that she's describing now. Um, dimensions are 104 by 102 inches. And this quilt, too, has been skillfully repaired and relined. It was presented by Miss Ella Hodgson, great-granddaughter of John Hewson, to the, Pen the Pennsylvania Museum of Art. And we would hope that they're still, it's still there. Maybe. You know, that's that's like another a whole nother like research project. I, I really just thought about the other day is some of these historic quilts that they're talking about in these books. Like, where are they now? And not just what ended up in the book, but like all of the other documentation that both Florence and Dr. Dutton and, you know, all of these people, uh, Ruth Finley, Marie Webster. Well, Marie Webster did. You know, she was looking a lot at showing her stuff. Um but yeah, like what happened to all these quilts? Like we know where some of them are. We, you know, we hope they're still in the museums that they originally were. But, you know, museums deaccession de stuff. You never know where this stuff ends up. Only slightly larger than the Houston quilt and showing identical construction um, is this next one. Let me show it to you before we start reading about it. So this one is called... The Safanisba Sof Peel Quilt. Now, there's somebody's name we won't forget. Safanisba. Safanisba. Maybe I'll, I'll, uh, I'll make that my stage name. <laughs> um, let's see. It, too, was made in Philadelphia by a member of a distinguished family, Sophonisba Angasiola. Oh, my goodness, this woman. Sophonisba Angasiola Peel, who was born in 1781, was a sister of Rembrandt Peel and 10th child of Charles Wilson Peel. Now, if I'm remembering correctly, there is a picture of Benjamin Rush who is Dr. Dunton's ancestor that was painted by Charles Wilson Peel. <laughs> These colonial people, <laughs> they're all connected. Around a geometrical eight-pointed star, cleverly pieced of material whose zigzag pattern of stripes gives the star an effect of twinkling, six successive borders have been arranged. In the right angles of the star, and in four of the narrow borders, a chintz pattern in a design of chained squares has been so utilized, utilized it simulates the effect of patchwork. Oh. Oh, okay. So what she's saying is... Man, why didn't I plug in the document camera? <laughs> So uh, these inner, see that inner one, the one that's really close to closer to the, the medallion, those little diamonds, that's apparently, that's a chintz or a border print. That's not piecing. Um, I actually have a quilt top that I don't know how old it is, but it's kind of got the same stuff going on. Um, you know, where it's got sort of these borders 
or sashing that looks like it's pieced, but when you look at it up close, you're like, oh, that's just a print. Um, so yeah, they, they were smart. They knew how to save time. <laughs> um, in the right angles of the star and in four of the narrow borders, a chintz patterned in a design. Oh, I already read that part. Blah, blah, blah. The third border out from center consists of chain squares set in backgrounds of tan. The wide border is comprised of eight pointed stars pieced of a variety of dark toned striped prints. The stars have been set into dark backgrounds of a fern patterned, ca patterned calico. The squares are outlined with narrow banding, appliqued. The star units have been set together chain fashion and in turn are backgrounded with a print showing scattered leaves. The border next to the center square is a wild goose chase, pieced of light colored calicos. Into the corners have been set square patches showing printed baskets of flowers and fruits. The style of coloring of which so closely resemble the flower bird butterfly prints credited to Houston. Oh, the idea occurs, may not these also be Houston prints? Two quilt makers, Zibaya and Sofanizba. <laughs> Lord, <laughs> you know, I should not make fun of these people's names because at least if you do their genealogy, you know who's who. Unless a Zabaya and Safanizba named their daughters those names too. So these two ladies were living in the same city, piecing their quilts within a few years of each other, probably had access to the same source of supply for their materials, and it appears they both followed in construction what seems to have been a trend of the period. I know, right? Those names are so good. Quilting on both the Houston and the Peel quilts is adequate, though of secondary interest. Students of textiles have found both quilts worthy of attention. <laughs> Can you imagine? Like, <laughs> I know kids with, you know, unusual names now. You know, your first day at school, your t the teacher's calling, doing roll call, and they're like... <laughs> you know like really struggling over somebody's name I, I feel bad for those kids so I imagine Zabaya and Sofanizba would so Sofanizba <laughs> poor ladies Charles Wilson Peel was born in Annapolis Maryland I did not know this in 1741 but for many years Philadelphia had been his established residence he married three times and had 18 children as you do when you're a colonial man <laughs> 11 of whom were born in the first marriage. Oh, Lord, that poor first wife. Perhaps it was faith and suggestion which prompted the artist to name his sons after the great masters, Raphael, Rembrandt, Van Dyke, Rubens, and there was also a Benjamin Franklin Peel. <laughs> During the entire period of the Revolution, Charles Wilson Peel served with the American forces. Rembrandt was born in Bucks County, his mother having fled from Philadelphia at the approach of the hostile British army. Of all this gifted family, Rembrandt more than, more than justified his father's faith. He not only painted all the American celebrities of the day, but is said to have done 47 portraits of George Washington, who sat many times for both father and son. Two of the Peel daughters achieved recognition for artistic ability. Of Safa Nispa, I know only that she made many beautiful quilts. She married Coleman Sellers, a well-known citizen of Philadelphia, and had six children, the youngest of whom was Coleman Sellers Jr., who became an internationally known engineer. Some of the quilts were pieced in the old home in Upper Darby and some in her son's home in Philadelphia. The pictured piece was presented to Mrs. Horace Wells Sellers, uh, by Mrs. Horace Wells Sellers to the, Phil the Pennsylvania Museum of Art, by courtesy of whom it has shown. Elzira, I love that. You know, it's funny, I think that in the South, they have, I mean, I have some, I have some relatives with some very strange names, but let's look at this one more time. I'll hold it this way, that's easier. <laughs> but yeah, like again, consider the fact that some of these borders are pieced and some are not. And I think it's that, it's really this middle one, the one that's right there that my finger's going over. That one I think is not pieced. That's that's the chintz that's doing that. In the first years of the 19th century, quilts were made which displayed an interesting combination of pieced work and applied design. So piecing and applique. One of the finest examples of this expression is shown in the frontispiece, which is this. 
This is the Mary Totten Rising Sun. And my guess, I guess she's going to talk about it, but I'm going to guess this is Mary Totten. He's probably the Totten, Fort Totten is named after. I bet you anything. Her husband or whomever. It is my favorite probably because I was the instrument which rescued it from the oblivion in which it had reposed. It, with others made by the same hand, came to light as a result of my eternal please show me your quilt campaign. <laughs> she was just like Dunton, <laughs> knocking on doors. You got any quilts? Mary Totten's Rising Sun is now part of the permanent collection of the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, where its dramatic beauty and amazing stitchery may be seen by those lovers of an art so peculiarly expressive of the ingenuity and personality of the women who practiced it. In the process of weaving oriental rugs, it is said that each family or tribe has a pattern distinctive and so well known to each member that it can be and often is tied in from memory. Something like that might be said of the quilt makers of the Totten family of Staten Island. Okay, so they're Staten Island. I still, I bet you anything. It doesn't talk about, I don't know. Totten's not that normal of a name. I feel like it's an odd enough name that... Fort Totten is a place around Southern Maryland, Prince George's County, maybe. Quilts in which the diamond-shaped patch has been used as a unit were pieced to form a large eight-pointed star built out until the points of the star marked the extent of the quilt's dimensions. So she basically is saying it's a giant star made up of, <laughs> of, uh, of diamonds. And of course, we know this pattern. I mean, this pattern is she's I think she's calling it a rising star Dr. Dunton of course calls it the star of Bethlehem which is the name it was often known by and we know it as a lone star you know this technique um and it's a you know it's a it's not a beginner quilt thing you know I mean you you have to be you, you have to be pretty skilled to make one of those I mean have it turn out right <laughs> um so, yeah. Oh, she does say this here. Modern quilt makers refer to this quilt as the Star of Bethlehem, sometimes the Lone Star. But among old-time needlewomen, it is known as the Rising Sun, being so designated in wills. Wills, okay. So, well, yeah. I mean, they left their quilts. And I would say a quilt like that, that's going to be in your will because that is that, that took a long time and a lot of energy to make. Um. Being so designated in wills which have come to my attention. Colonial and pioneer women had this in common. They rose early and toiled late. A rising sun was a familiar sight, an apt name for a quilt pattern. Although structurally a star, accent in coloring was so arranged that concentric circles of blending tones radiated from the center. And from the effect thus obtained may have come the earlier name. The use of this pattern was fairly common, but the Totten quilts are unique in their complementary decoration. It is the right angled spaces between the points which offer opportunity for expression of individual taste and skill in treatment. On some quilts, these spaces have been filled with smaller pieced stars and sometimes with quilting stitchery. Mary Totten decorated her rising sun with lavish but inspired hand, and she commingled colors. The prevalent dark tones of plum, wine reds, tawny orange, turquoise blue, in such a way that her patchwork quilt of humble cotton prints resembles an eastern textile. I need to change my glasses out because they are, well, I gotta take a drink. Um, yeah, for you, those of you guys that wear glasses, have you ever heard of something called um, nerd wax? It's this stuff that it's almost like comes in like a chapstick like container and uh, you rub it on the bridge of your glasses and it like <laughs> grips to your face. It's basically like a waxy stuff. Anyway, it's great. I don't have it on these glasses and so they keep. Uh, um, the use, uh, I already read that. <laughs> Mature roses and other flowers have been cut from a soft lustered chintz and incorporated into the design. 
but the hundreds of leaves and rosebuds have been fashioned of calico. True patchwork. Yeah, Angelina, look up Nerd Wax. <laughs> it's kind of expensive, but I really like it. Um, they also make really cute eyeglass cleaners. The composition forms Mary's conception of artistic ornamentation for the right angles of her star and for the border. A border beautifully relevant to the rest of the plan. Vases, birds, fruits, raised by padding, have been made of calicos. Stemming of deftly twisted, bias-cut, bottle green calico has been whipped down on both sides to the background material. And from a continuous main stem branch out smaller stems. With attached flowers, fruits, and buds, the treatment so suggestive of East Indian art. A chain border outlines the edge finished with a red binding. On some quilts, loops of a chain border enclose roses and other posies. Into the loops of her chain, Mary set an inlay of red in a green oval, and she liked the trick well enough to use it on all of her quilts. An inner border alternates a rosebud with a leaf, delicate and pleasing. Careful, evenly spaced quilting stitchery follows the intricate design so closely, a faithful duplicate of the quilt's design is reproduced on the back of the spread. This, in spite of the difficulty presented by an inner lining, which shows cotton plentifully studded with cotton seeds, at the same time of one of the vases, uh, I'm sorry, at the side of one of the vases are the initials M.T. The quilt is in splendid condition, uh, M.T., yeah, Mary Totten, Mary Totten. The quilt is in splendid condition, though the backing shows brown age stains. Such a magnificent spread must have been planned for a bedchamber on the grand scale, for the great room or a guest room. Today's generation might convert such a piece into a wall hanging where it would show to advantage as a background for, substan for a substantial mahogany lowboy or a knee hole desk. <laughs> Florence had some ideas about decorating. Um, in fact, later in her later years, some of the magazine work she was doing, um, you know, they had her making, um, she did kind of little crafts too. And some of the women's magazines had her, you know, writing stories about, you know, decoration on a dime kind of stuff. Yeah, <laughs> better homes and pedo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, Druid, I too have done that with tissue. <laughs> I sometimes have my glasses like all cocked to the side like that. <laughs> I think I I think I need a new prescription. I, I mentioned that the other day, I think. Now what about Mary Totten? She was born in 1781 and died in 1861 and was one of seven children born to Gilbert Totten and his wife Mary Butler. Gilbert Totten was second son of John Totten a man of Welsh extraction who had settled first in Long Island and then removed to Staten Island, where his descendants were born and have remained. Mary did not marry. Mary did not marry <laughs> as early in life as her sisters, but she married twice. First, Reverend John Polemus, and second, Matthew Williams. There are no children born of either marriage. Okay, so maybe she is not the Totten of my area. There must have been some numerous Tottens. Um, her stepdaughter, Mary Weir Lee, said of her, Mary Williams was one of the sweetest old ladies that ever lived, and her husband's family loved her dearly. <laughs> Mrs. Lee told of the courtship of the Reverend Mr. Polemus, a clergyman who was in the habit of visiting at the home of Gilbert Totten in Westfield, had a friend, another clergyman, who was despondent over the death of his wife. The first clergyman told him his told his despondent friend that he knew a lady on Staten Island who was worth her weight in gold. The despondent man came to Westfield, met Mary, and married her. All this throws a light on the quilt maker's character, but unfortunately does not account for her artistic talents. Mary's father, Gilbert Totten, was one of the founders of the first Methodist church on Staten Island, which was the second in America. It stood on the site now occupied by the Woodrow Methodist Episcopal Church, and in the adjoining cemetery lie the remains of Reverend Mr. Polemus, Polemus 
And this is an excerpt from the will left by Mary Williams. In the name of God, amen. I love how they start wills like that. I, Mary Williams, of the town of Westfield, County of Richmond, and State of New York, being of sound mind and memory, and considering of, the, of this frail and transitory life, do therefore make, orde ordain, publish, and declare this to be my last will and testament. Aren't they so dramatic? <laughs> oh, my last will and testament. That is to say, first, after all my lawful debts are paid and discharged, I give and bequeath to Mary, um, Rachel Mary Drake, daughter of William Drake, deceased, my large spread called the Rising Sun. I then give and bequeath to Elizabeth Drake, wife of William Drake, deceased, and to Marianne Dubois, all my furniture and clothing to be divided equally share and share alike. <laughs> Legalese is very dramatic, yes. Elizabeth Drake and Mary Ann Dubois were sisters, nieces of Mary Williams, both being children of Mary's sister, Rachel Totten Johnson. Uh, Rachel Mary, to whom the quilt was left, was Elizabeth's daughter. Three rising sons, almost identical in treatment, were made in the Totten family, two in Mary's generation, and both are credited to her. Mary Ann Dubois made the third. She signed and dated it, Mary Ann Dubois, <laughs> John Dubois. October 6th, 1835. Mary Ann's quilt is a duplicate of her aunt's, except that it shows generally deeper tones of coloring and includes the insertion of a cartouche or border at two ends, making the spread an oblong instead of a square. The Dubois farmhouse stood on the north side of Amboy Road opposite Mount Loretto between Richmond Valley and Pleasant Plains. So I don't know a whole lot about New York. Um, so this area is Staten Island. I don't, yeah, I don't know that area very well. The sunflower, oh, let's look at that one real quick. That's another plate. I think this one's kind of plain. Oh, there we go. So the sunflower Kind of like those little hearts in the middle, like in those in the alternate squares, the little hearts they meet the tips of the meat. The sunflower shows another quilt probably made by Mary Totten, which has the appearance of being older than the rising suns. This version of the sunflower pattern is very old, and the illustration shows the old time method of setting it together, how the round pieced blocks are fitted into shaped patches conforming to the curved circle. Later, quilt makers still used the sunflower pattern extensively, but they usually fitted it into a square or applicated it to a square background block. The units were then joined together with the familiar strips of latticework. The textiles in this old quilt are a delight. Light blue and rose on darker blue, pink on tan and brown, soft reds, dotted black, <clears throat> rosy brown stripes on a richer deep brown. Background, now the color of coffee ice cream. <laughs> she's she's she definitely she conjures something up um ba, 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 ba. light blue flowered calico has been used for the four leaf clovers oh i thought of them as hearts <laughs> i guess the four leaf clovers which alternate with the sunflowers along the outer edge of the quilt runs the favored chain border done in red and green as on the other spreads almost a signature Indeed, there are characteristics to needlecraft as marked as those of penmanship, and it is legitimate to take them into consideration when trying to identify old patchwork quilts. The Totten spreads and their story are pictured and recorded by courtesy of a collateral descendant, Mrs. Ella Totten Butler, to whom they were a heritage. And that is part one of chapter one. And... Looks like she's got three more quilts in this one section that she's going to talk about next. And we'll, we'll look at those on Thursday. So I think that Florence seems to have a little bit more of a readable style <laughs> than, uh, you know, I feel like Marie Webster also had a very readable style. Um, and Ruth Finley was she was a lot more difficult to read, I feel like, because she kind of went on and on. And certainly Darby, her husband actually Emmett <laughs> uh, we know him as Darby and in, in, in their uh 
their uh, anonymously written book, but I feel like their writing was like very, you know, of that time, like very flowery and hard to read. Um, but Florence and, and Marie Webster seem to write a little bit more um, conversationally, maybe, um, which I like. I mean, you know, obviously we are easier to read. So, oh, yeah, you know, some of these images, like, oh, I would just love to know, like, what they really looked like in real life. But, yeah, I mean, um, some of these really bold ones would make, you know, be so cool to to reproduce and um <laughs> I too like coffee ice cream <laughs> so but I don't know if you can tell it is really hard to see but on this one the way she described this can you see this where around the edges of the the uh, sunflowers you can see like it's a seam um so essentially what she is saying is Mary Totten made this she had these circles and then she made them <laughs> inset into this shape like that and that shape is where those um those four leaf clovers reside in that 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 shape so <laughs> I mean that's some difficult stitchery I can tell you there's no way I can make that and have it be flat um you know that's so much curve it, it's um it's a very challenging I would say that's it, that's not intermediate that's like advanced um and I don't know why anybody would do that <laughs> you know these these days like people don't piece like that they um I, I think probably uh like double wedding ring is almost you, you end up having to do that but um I would say there's not a whole lot of patterns that today people would do that with yeah it's yeah brain work robin and like fingers like i just you know i struggle with curves and it's something i come back to again and again to practice um but you know <laughs> curves I, you know there, there's there's methods for piece and curves that that really work out but it's like a lot of patience so all right you guys are you ready for some of this sweet <laughs> um you know, I like curves, and that's why I keep going back to them. Um, I really would like to make a junk, some version of Junkard's Path one day. Um, there's the one layout, Stepping Around the Mountain, which, the you know, the way that you turn them, it makes this really cool, like, wreath-shaped thing. So it's like a wreath, which I think it's supposed to be the mountain. And then in the center, there's, like, a cluster. Um, I think it, it, it it's just a really pretty quilt. So... <laughs> fear disdain yeah like be neutral <laughs> be neutral until you try it um but yeah there's some really great tutorials on um you know just a not necessarily a shallow curve but just like that kind of quarter curve that sort of singular quarter curve that you do with like a um a drunkard's path block you know you're just doing that that quarter of a circle there's some really great um tutorials and once you master that I mean really you know, the various techniques are, they're not that difficult to learn, but it's just the practice, you know, and once you do the first one and realize like, oh, I didn't ease that very well because I have a lot more um, of the outside curve left than the inside curve. <laughs> like you've got this dangler out there and you're like, oh, that's not supposed to be there. Um, but yeah, they're, they're, um, I think it's very, it feels very satis satisfying when you, you get one to work out. So well, our unseen guest, um, we are about three quarters of the way through, and I said I wanted to finish this by th uh, by Halloween, and I, I think we're going to manage it. So, um, yeah, you know, Angelina, I think of Drunkard's Path as one of those. Um, it's one of those patterns like um, like log cabin and um, courtyard steps, where depending on how you orient the block, the, the unit. Um, and what you do with colors it I mean you just it's like a totally different quilt you know and it's just by virtue of turning them one way or the other way and and then you know what direction the next one is it's so amazing I, I did a whole bunch of sketches just trying different things out and I mean it's endless which you can you know come up with very cool <clears throat> so 
Are you guys ready for some unseen guests? I know uh, this one is, he's gonna talk about quantity. We've talked about quality. We've talked about um, consciousness. Uh, what was this last one? Was individuality. Um, yeah, it's, it's getting real cerebral in here. <laughs> so just as a summary, um, as a reminder, our unseen guest is written by um, anonymously by a couple named uh, Darby and Joan, and they are actually Ruth and Emmett Finley, uh, Ruth Finley being uh, the author of a quilt book. Um, they were both journalists, and somehow they found themselves with a friend who is actually a ghost named Stephen. <laughs> and I say ghost just as shorthand. Uh, ghost is not quite the right word for what he, he seems to be. Um, but, you know, our central question here is, were the Finleys experiencing something for real? Or did they think it was real? Or did they make all this stuff up because spiritualism was really popular at this time and they wanted to make a buck? Those are the, that's the central question here. Um, oh my gosh, pickle dish. Yes, 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 Robin. That is one that I have never tried um, I've made some, um, a couple of things with, um, a double wedding ring. Um, but yeah, um, the pickle dish with those little, you know, those little tiny points. Oh my Lord. <laughs> Do we catch their grift? You know, the way this book is written so far, I know Angelina, you haven't been here, um, a lot during the reading of this book. I guess everybody else here, what do you guys think? You know, put it in the chat what you're thinking. I know a couple people have been like, yeah, they think they're, they think they're having an experience. They believe it, but mm, I don't know. My, my issue with it is I understand, you know, if, if this, you know, this, this phenomenon can be, people look at it and they're like, oh, you're a bunch of crackpots. That's why they use the fake name. Um, and they refer to people as Mrs you know, Mrs. K. And I understand that for living people, you, you know, you're going to write a book like this. You don't want to like dox people, but they talk about historic things too. And the, and like Stephen was supposedly a, a soldier who died. He was an American soldier who died over in France and during world war one. And why couldn't they give his name? I don't know. It's just, well, you'll see. <laughs> Okay, so this is chapter 22, known as quantity. And if you remember, there's quality and there's quantity. And quality of consciousness is what we build here in the earth realm. That's quantity. Quality is what we build, or consciousness is what we build in this other realm, the after death realm. So today we're talking about quality. I think my voice is doing pretty good considering <clears throat> I'm going on an hour and 20 minutes with you guys. And before that, I did two, two plus hours of practice. So <laughs> I'm going to sound like Janis Joplin. Ah. Okay. So chapter 22, quantity. Stephen at our next meeting was, ho oh, oh, you know what? Before I, ah, I forget, you guys have to remind me of these things. Oh, where's my little, uh, I gotta have the right overlay or background or whatever it is. Okay, so Stephen at our next meeting was wholly determined to complete his discussion of the quantity of consciousness. He led off thus. Quantity of consciousness is developed not simply through the undergoing of mortal experience, but rather through its assimilation. The man who greatly develops his quantity orders his experience, which of itself is chaotic. He learns of life not only he learns of life not only knowledge but wisdom. Okay. Now to say that in its potentiality such a servant. Let me start that again. Oh, I know lots of water and tea. That's the rest of my week, is uh, lozenges and whatnot. <clears throat> All right, let me try this again. Now, to say that in its potentiality, such a servant attribute as reason is qualitative is a fairly accurate way of stating the truth. 
That sounded like word salad. <laughs> its earth plane development, however, is quali- or quantitative. Quantitative earth plane. And the individual who develops such an attribute thereby gathers unto himself some measure of quantity, but not necessarily the greatest measure. And why not, Darby? The goal I answered is complete and perfect recognition by the individual of his partness with the whole. Great is the quantity of the man who uses his quality, be it high or not so high, in service of the whole. Again, spelled Stephen, there is joy in heaven. A man of great mental attainment, if he would greatly develop his quantity, must place his mental equipment at the disposal of the whole's development. Truly, service is the practical expression of quantity. Interesting. Am I right? Service, being of service to others. Hmm. Even if it's a grift, it's a good one, right? (laughs) Stephen is telling them good things. Oh, geez. If you guys are hearing my my desktop blowing up, (laughs) I'm getting some messages coming in. Um... And now I must set down the fact that no sooner had my scholarship for a second time caused joy in heaven that I betrayed a grievous misunderstanding. And now must I set down the fact that no, oh, I said, except Stephen, as the individual wins quantity from sources outside himself, from where, from where does it come? Oh Lord, Darby. (laughs) So basically, where does this come from? And yet, how preposterous if the quantity of one man's consciousness is won by him at the expense of another's. Preposterous is right, spelled the Ouija board. I have said nothing to justify your inference. The whole of consciousness can neither increase nor diminish. Science has glimpsed this fact in its theory of the conservation of matter and energy. But that whole is subject to development both of a quantitative and qualitative nature, and the individual differs not from the whole. Man's development on earth is quantitative. This does not mean that he actually amasses consciousness. It means only that consciousness which he is develops quantitatively. Okay, so what I'm guessing is he's saying, like, you can't stack consciousness up like it's a thing. Like, you can't, like keep dropping consciousness in your bucket and have that be quantitativeness you just develop this quantity by being alive it sounds like i raised the white flag joan complaining of fine spun theories shifted the trend of the discussion stephen she said can you take a specific individual and tell us of his quantitative development well that sounds good (laughs) <laughs> preposterous to spell the Ouija board <laughs> right and you know at this point I think we've seen how they bounce around in here like sometimes Joan is just sitting there like mm, she's getting the, the transmission and she's saying it and Darby's writing it down and then other times they're on the Ouija board and then there's the time where was it Mr. K was like bam hey I'm here I'm a ghost I'm talking to you guys <laughs> so But this seems like this is when they're using the Ouija board. So I don't know when in the whole story this is supposed to be. But surely, answered the Ouija board, inviting Joan and me to consider the instance of one I shall call D.R., an old man afflicted with an incurable disease, which, though it permitted him to be about, had rendered him quite childish. Oh, my God. So this guy's got maybe some intellectual disability here. Um... I'm guessing uh, if he's an old man, it's probably dementia. But um. Joan and I had spent Christmas with DR. DR, as you have always recognized, is of a high quality of consciousness, spelled Stephen. He has, however, developed the quantity of his consciousness out of all proportion, out of all proportion to his qualities. Though never possessed of great reasoning power, he had an unusual retentive memory. This he developed to its utmost, thereby compensating for what he lacked in reason. 
Then, too, he had unusual insight into human nature, and this also he fostered. His third great asset was his liking for people and the resulting craving for good opinion. This cast of mind he put to great advantage. It gave him sympathy for many men of many sorts, and at the same time saved him from falling into the pitfalls laid for the good mixer. <laughs> now by using what gifts he had, D.R. developed quantity, such as is frequently unachieved by men of greater quality. There was, it is true, a selfishness in his quality, but because of his quantitative development, he was able to overcome this and give to the world a great service. And here's a thought that will bear being, that will bear being kept with you always. DR, by the development of his own quantity and by virtue of the service that necessarily resulted from that development, was the direct cause of the development of quantity in hundreds of others. Ah. The hundreds whom directly and indirectly he served. So that's kind of nice. You know, you're, you know, you hear people say, like, I do this service and if I help one person, it's all worthwhile. That's kind of what it sounds like. But he's helped a lot of people. The thought that she will do well always to hold on to this, that the individual's development of the quantity of consciousness leavens the whole of consciousness. The kingdom of heaven is like unto, is like unto leaven which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. I'm guessing that's a quote from something biblical. I don't know. Um, Must DR soon die? Asked Joan. I am no fortune teller, answered Stephen. But this I will say, that DR is being prepared for graduation. And remember, graduation is the death. His old friend, H.J., dead these many years, is with him constantly. The other day he recognized his friend. Oh, okay. <laughs> now that's interesting because, I mean, you think about people like, um, you know, people, when people are dying, they sometimes see other people there. They see, um, you know, uh, friends and relatives that have gone before them and who knows? I mean, that kind of spooky stuff happens for sure. I, we have a really good friend who worked in hospice for a lot of years and he would tell stories about, you know, people that were really close uh, to going and the things, the, 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 the experiences that they had. And, um, you know, I always thought, oh gosh, I don't think I could do that kind of work. That would be like, oh, so tough, but also so interesting, you know, because I mean, our ultimate question is what happens after we die? We don't know. You know, you can't exactly experiment with this, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> like <laughs> a successful experimentation means you don't get to come back. Um, so, you know, these experiences of people who are really, you know, close there on the edge, um, I think they're, they're worth something. But, um, you know, again, like it's not like you can, after they die, go back and say, so how was that? Like what happened? <laughs> um <clears throat> And it was true. A letter we received a few days later told us that DR had asked, quite without thought of the thing being abnormal, what is H doing here? Had DR a few months before mentioned his dead friend as being present with him, we would have set the affair down to set the affair down as hallucination of a wavering mind. Even now we cannot assert that it was otherwise. Yet to be told one week by a Ouija board that DR recognized his dead friend's presence and the next week to be informed in a letter from DR's home that he had inquired what is H doing here, this pulls one up to a stop. Can coincidence, the accidental agreement of the words of an irresponsible toy and the actual fact as it was developing miles distant account for such a happening? Yes, ma'am, we do get messages in different ways. That is for sure. <clears throat> DR will graduate happily, continued Stephen. His usefulness on earth is impaired by his physical disability, and he is eager for consciousness resuming of his work. I'm sorry, conscious resuming of his work. You may have noticed his restlessness. He is impatient to be away. When he has graduated, what mind will he have, I asked? His former activity, his former active mentality, or that which he now is. He is sick now, said Stephen. That is all. Upon graduation, he will come into possession of all that he 
ever was and far more than he knew himself to be. Is then, Joan asked, the old age mind just a sick mind? It results simply from the breaking down of the material brain and nervous system, Stephen replied. Often, too, as is the case of DR, old age is a period of preparation for graduation. Do you mean that DR, despite his mental feebleness, is still developing, I questioned, adding that he seemed so far away. Yes, for graduation, Stephen answered. That which you note as uncanniness is but the result of new appreciations he is developing, new realization of the whole of which he is a part. Hmm. Yeah, graduating is, sounds nicer than dropping dead, right? <laughs> And, you know, and, and Angelina, the whole idea of graduation is like, it, Stephen is saying it's like, you know, the, the corporeal death is not the end. You've just graduated into a new existence. Do you mean that DR, despite his mental femaleness, is still developing? Yes, for graduation. That which you note as uncanny. Uh, 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 new realization of the whole of which he is a part. But I said, he seems to me unhappy. He is not unhappy, spelled Stephen. He is but impatient to come back to the whole of his degree of quality, as all who do not experience sudden death are glad to come back. He would come back to the broader consciousness, to recognition of the great truth, to work, to service, and the development of a new quality according to the quantity he has achieved. Although he knows what he always believed, that earth life is preparation of the mortal for immortality. Why, I asked, did he believe this? He never made profession of religion. Because in the practice of his calling, Stephen replied, it was given him to be present at so many graduations and hear the testimony of delight at the meeting of passing souls with friends. It is the beautiful glimpse. Deathbed visions, I asked. Yes, said Stephen, but to the passing soul, these experiences are not visions. They are reality. And then, in seeming defiance of the untheoretical Joan, the Ouija board spelled. A word more of summary. Take consciousness as the one and only whole. Suppose it to be divided into halves. Now, suppose the individual's consciousness to be divided into halves. The halves of consciousness are quality and quantity. The halves of the individual's consciousness are, at least for the purposes of psychology, soul and mind. The soul of the individual is to be prepared, is to be compared to quality, the mind to quantity. Now, the quality of the consciousness of an individual may be, in fact, is of a certain degree. Degrees of quality may be high or low and are easily recognized. So also is it with quantity. As an individual then at graduation possesses his original degree endowment of quality and the added degrees of quantity like earth life developed. And just as his development of quantity on earth depended in the final limit on his degree of quality, so his qualitative progress here will be governed by his earthly quantitative advance, save, however, as each individual's gift of quantity leavens the whole. Whew. <laughs> Hi, Yakama. How are you? Well, that was something, <laughs> you know, and, and I like the fact that he finally made the point that quality is the soul while quantity is the mind. And, you know, I, I think about like in the psychology of communication. So our, the, the way that we communicate, um, that's something that I have done a lot of work on in terms of like my corporate training experience and the things that we would teach, um, you know, in terms of like, um, you know, in communication and how we, um, what's the word I'm looking for here? Hmm. Hmm. I kind of lost the, I can't, can't quite download it. Um, but, oh, so what do you, what do you want me to repeat? The part, is it the part about the soul and the mind? Um, oh, soul is quality, mind is quantity. So, okay, that was where I was going with this. So, the mind 
so when you talk about so I think about processing something that's difficult um, you know maybe you experience something traumatic and um, logically your mind is telling you well, it's not a big deal you know we'll, we'll get over this but your emotions are like ah, you know screaming out and so to me like you know I'm thinking about you know emotions versus logic that's what that's how our communication like concretely comes together you know um, an emotion is kind of all of that like nebulous stuff right like you can't quite like all of our emotions are really hard to pin down whereas logic is something like we can write that down on paper so it seems to me like when he's ta- when they're talking about mind equals quantity like that's all the stuff you're gathering about yourself as a human being on on the earth plane of existence so you're having all these experiences and your logical mind is is gathering and building and you know whatever you know it might be intelli- like 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 intelligence like we think of intelligence but it could be other intelligences you know like um you know skills and just doing other things like kinesthetic experience like that's movement and um you know like mathematical you know like just a whole bunch of different ways for people to build up build up their knowledge and it sounds to me like that's what he's talking about when he says quantity you're like you're taking all this stuff in and then when you're on this non-earth plane that's where quality is important and quality is your soul and so I mean I guess by virtue of what you learn on earth you can improve yourself in the afterlife I guess so your mind can do its part and then after you've graduated then your soul is going to reap those benefits I don't know I mean what do you guys think like does it sound like that's what he's saying I mean I I feel like you know I I need to get a Ouija board and ask Stephen am I misunderstanding (laughs) oh my god you guys (laughs) Drew it I don't mean to freak you out but like what if I got a Ouija board and Stephen showed up like (laughs) Happy Halloween! Steven's here! (laughs) Um, So yeah, so that's the end of that chapter. Um, Now, it's interesting. The person that originally owned this book, I think I mentioned this a really long time ago. um, They, and I don't know if you can actually see this, it's very faint. Um, They wrote what I guess is their their name, but they've written it as (laughs) M.L. McM. ML McM. Um, it's going back to Easter philosophies. Yeah, you know, Angelina, that we're finding in this book, there's a lot of that stuff when he <clears throat> he'll talk about stuff and we're like, that is like center of Buddhist philosophy. Like this whole like, you know, we are all part of the same consciousness, like all that. And then um, you know, this idea of definitely reincarnation, you know, the Eastern philosophy of reincarnation, you know, to this point where you reach enlightenment. And I think that there, I believe there was a part where he's talking in here about the qualitative experience and the goal there is eventually to be, you know, reaching some, you know, some, they've never said, they've never said reincarnation, but like, you have to read into this, that they're talking about reincarnation here, Um, you know, with coming back and forth between you know, each time you're on earth and each time you're in the, the other place. Um, but yeah, and, and kind of that's, that's spiritualism, you know, spiritualism was really popular at this time. And, um, you know, again, some of the stuff that they talked about is definitely like this merging together of a lot of different religions and, and, you know, religious traditions. Um, and you know, then some of it is just complete bullshit, <laughs> you know, and I hate to say it that way, but like, Um, you know, the table tipping and all of that stuff that has been debunked by, you know, the mediums and the psychics of the day. Um, this book was written in 1920. Um, yeah. And, and yet you're correct, Ikama, like that, that philosophy definitely was not well known in the West until like the Victorian period. Um, and in the Victorian period, they got, um, how heavily spiritualism cribbed from this you mean how heavily they cribbed this from spiritualism (laughs) because the spirit spiritualism as a like as a a a formal group I mean I don't want to say it's a religion because it's not it you know it's a, a as a formal concept 
um, really grew out of like this Victorian um, era. And they, in, in the Victorian era, they were very interested in the East, the Far East. And so definitely people were starting to like read texts, like, you know, the, the, uh, the Vedas um, in, in ancient Hinduism and, you know, pulling in like a lot of Buddhist philosophy, all that kind of stuff. Um, and yeah, yeah, absolutely. They were, they were stealing. <laughs> um, but anyway, so the person that owned this book, they jotted in here, soul equals quality, mind equals quantity. Um, quantity is developed by earth life, quality on another plane. So, yeah, that's this person's little clip notes. So, yes, Yogananda. Now, um, was Yogananda, um, Yogananda was involved in theosophy or no, I'm thinking of somebody else. Oh gosh, what is the guy's name? Oh, I can't remember his name. Um. But yeah, so you've got the spiritualists, and then you have the theosophy, um, Madame Blavatsky. Those those folks were kind of like I don't know if it was an offshoot or, you know, I I've read a lot of this stuff and also forgotten it. <laughs> I took a bunch of religion classes when I was in um, in college with the intent of like more like religious iconography and art, and then it ended up you know I ended up in classes that were very heavily focused on the religious text and honestly I had to drop out of the the um it was called Indian tradition and it was about like I think the Bhagavad Gita and then like this whole stack of Vedic scriptures were like our reading list and at the time I was I was taking some really like tough classes and I was like I can't I can't I'm too stupid for this <laughs> so I dropped that class but um yeah absolutely this everything you guys are saying is like yep you know what they're talking about and you're absolutely right Druid they would have had limit. They would have been limited. All that they would have been able to have were textbooks um, and these, you know, books and scriptures that people had written. Um, and so, I mean, you definitely see if you when you study this stuff, it's it's people of, you know, people of means that, you know, develop spiritualism. Spiritualism was a, a rich man's game. <laughs> um, so, it's really it's it's interesting. It's all very very interesting. And yes, also super dense. Um, I know, I don't think Kenny's here today, but Kenny, um, he's, he'll talk about like quantum mechanics and stuff. And then I'm like, oh, you're so smart, you know? And he's like, I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I can't wrap my head around it either. So, but he's also done a lot of like reading on, you know, some of the other, this esoteric stuff. So pretty interesting. Well, that said, yeah, the Bhagavad Gita, I still have a copy of it, um, I have not touched it since 1993. So, <laughs> yes, Robin. You know, and and you know, again, like if you think about the Titanic, like, um, you know, these ways of like luxury travel. You know, people could, you know, wasn't like, you know, hoofing it through some caravan across the Middle East to get anywhere anymore. You know, it would take decades to walk from one end of the earth to the other. Um, you know, they had faster conveyances in the Victorian era. They had train, you know, train travel. You could get from, you know, one side of the U.S. to the other reasonably quickly. I mean, nowadays we'd look at it as, um, like a drag. My, my father-in-law likes to take the train from like New York to, uh, San Francisco. And I'm like, you're crazy. <laughs> That's just like a big waste of a week. <laughs> but you know, like getting somewhere like that in a week was amazing. And, um, yeah, the same thing with, uh, you know, traveling on these, like, big cruise ships and stuff or these, you know, ocean liners that was, um, could only be afforded by the, the, the fancy people, the rich people, people of means, um, or, you know, you're down in steerage as an immigrant, um, or, you know, part of the crew, but, so things like that industrial, like, uh, you know, widening of the world's sphere to people that had means, definitely, you know, it spurred on a whole, like, revolution in culture. So, yeah, you know, I mean, I, I joke about <laughs> giving my, my father-in-law a hard time. I, I mean, I do give him a hard time, but it is kind of cool, you know, like, where the train goes. Sometimes you're on the East Coast, the train, there's nothing to look at. I mean, you go through, like, from here 
you're immediately going through like the really bad parts of like Delaware and Pennsylvania and then you get into New Jersey and it's like <clears throat> it's Trenton from the south to north it's like industrial it's terrible but um yeah I know my father-in-law has said like cross country there's a lot of like really cool stuff um but yeah, if you ever do, you know, get to do that bucket list item, um, he said booking a berth was not worth it. So for what it's worth. So one more time, happy, 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 happy birthday to Druid. I hope you have the most fantastic birthday. Um, and because it is your birthday, you get to decide who do we raid. So I'll give you a second to decide. Um, is a German guy going to be it or whoever, <laughs> whoever you want. Um, oh, very cool, Yukamo. Now, does Canada, and Eva, you're here, does Canada have um, like a, like a, uh, like a train thing, like, you know, like a travel thing like they do in Europe? Um, you know, I know that like you can just sort of in Europe, you just sort of jump on a train and you go anywhere. <laughs> um and I don't know a whole lot about travel in, in Canada. So how exciting, you know, I think about that, like you being a new citizen there. I mean, what an, ex I mean, obviously like uh, a huge um, accomplishment, um, but just also how exciting, like, you know, like this new chapter in your life. I love it. So yes. Thank you for my happy early birthday as well. Um, I used to celebrate birthday month. <laughs> I've gotten a little less, um, you know, a little less self-centered and I just do the birthday week. So that's okay, Eva. You know, if you're doing something, um, if you're doing something productive with a quilt, my gosh. Yes. Yes. All right. So you guys want to, um, read Jamie today? I can do that. So, um, just real quick. So tomorrow, of course, we'll be quilt nerd tomorrow night. We'll see you then. Um, Thursday, I will be back at 2 p.m. Eastern time, and I will have a very funny Dr. Dunton thing to read you. Um, and then uh, next week, I'll be here Monday, and then I'm out the rest of the week because of AQSG. So um, hopefully I'll be doing some pop-ups, but it's nothing I can promise, um, mainly because the schedule's crazy, and also... I don't know that my, I mean, unless I, from my hotel room would be totally fine, but like the way Mary does it with her phone, um, I don't have 5G. So I don't know how good <laughs> this stream would be. So we're going to have to play it by ear, but definitely I'll, I'll try to do something. Worst case, I will stick my head into one of Mary's um, pop-ups. So anyway, um, I will hopefully see you guys tomorrow night. If I don't, have a fantastic week. And let me grab Jamie's. Why can I never remember Jamie's thing? It's Jamie Daggers, right? Oops. Make sure I spell it right. Yep. Okay, you guys, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna raid and run. So uh, give my regards to Jamie <laughs> and I will see you guys soon. Mwah! Oh, and I didn't give a shout out to Kenny. Kenny streams on Wednesdays and Saturdays or Sundays. Bye guys.